Hello, uh, everyone, in this um, second morning session. It's the fourth um, panel of the CU opening conference. Uh, welcome, welcome in Budapest to all of you here uh, gathered at the CUDI Institute, but also um, available and being with us um, online. The panel is called The Robustness of the Rule of Law, Past and Present. And it's coordinated by, uh, by two working groups um, that exist, work and function at the CU DI, Democracy uh, in History, which is led by uh, Balash Trenseni, and, and the Rule of Law led by uh, Dmitry Kochanov. You know, this is a group of brilliant scholars dealing with, the, at first sight, totally different topics of, of discussion. So we thought it would be might be really this, uh, interesting to join those two groups and try to discuss the rule of law from the perspective of what we already know from, from the past and how can it may affect the future if, if, if that is possible. My name is Barbara Grabowska-Moros. I'm a research fellow at, at the CUDI at one of those research group, meaning um, uh, rule of law. Um, yesterday, I think during the second round panel, one of the speakers was saying, you know, future is already today, it's already here. So the question would be, is history still with us? Or maybe we can see or predict the future. Maybe future is already as well um, being here um, uh, with us, especially when we feel that history is happening, especially after yesterday ruling um, in Warsaw from Shucha Street. Um, when I was preparing for this panel, I found this really brilliant um, paper of Martin Kregian, also a research fellow uh, at the CU DIR, different from, from Australia. I hope he's with us today as, as, as well. When he said, when he wrote, if there were ever a subject that could benefit from the historical awareness and this interdisciplinary mixing, it is the rule of law. So I think this is a great opportunity to check whether this thesis is still, um, still correct and how we can, in fact, um, develop this, um, um, this notion of, of, of the rule of law, both as a legal and political um, ideal. We have four brilliant speakers today with us. Uh, we have Petra Bart, who is now uh, in Florence um, as a as a Fernand Bernard Fellow at the EUI, but she's also a research affiliate at CUDI, research at, at CU Legal Studies Department, and also Associate Professor of, uh, of LT University Department of um, Criminology. Uh, we work together with, uh, with Petra in the Reconnect um, project financed by the uh, European Commission, where we exactly discuss different aspects of the rule of law, both theoretically and uh, practically speaking. We also have Marta Buchholz today with us, a professor of sociology at the University of Warsaw. She used to work also at the University of Bonn for five years. And right now she's uh, working on the um, project called Towards Illiberal Constitutionalism in East Central Europe, Historical Analysis in Comparative and Transnational Perspective. It's financed by Volkswagen Foundation, which I think fits brilliantly in this um, discussion about, you know, history, presence um, and future. We have uh, Mark Lazar with us. He's available uh, online. Uh, he's a professor of political history and sociology. He is a head of um, Center for History at Science Po. He's also president of the School of Government at Lewis University in, uh, in Rome. And he, his field of, um, of research is left um, in Europe and also populism in France, and, um, and Italy. Finally, we have uh, Kolya Rabo with us, um, assistant professor at the um, European Studies at Faculty of Social um, Sciences at Q11. He's a director of um, Center for European Studies also at, at Levin University. And we also work together in the Reconnect project about um, different aspects of, um, <clears throat> of the ru rule of law. Um, and I was thinking that we, we could start today discussion with kind of a little bit like general um, remarks or trying to find links between rule of law and history, the things that happened and we, that we could learn from, um, uh, from, from history. Maybe we will be able to find at least some ideas to uh, answer the question, why is it going so bad with the rule of law currently, especially in Europe? Uh, However, I would really like to find some kind of optimistic conclusions in the very end. So maybe starting with not, not, pass, not the, the most optimistic uh, aspects of, of the history. Could we find answers, you know, why is it happening so bad? Maybe let's start with, uh, with Marta with this 
tricky question. Thank you. Thank you very much. And uh, first of all, many thanks to the organizers for having me in this panel. It's a great honor and a great pleasure to be here again. And I am ever so happy that the Democracy Institute is there. It's really reassuring from the Polish perspective, let me say it out loud. And I will not speak about the elephant in the room. I will not speak about the yesterday's judgment of the Polish Constitutional Tribunal. Instead, I will start with the general remarks. And I will speak as a sociologist. And, you know, we sociologists are very inclined to be rather theoretically um, minded about things. So my first observation is indeed very theoretical. And it is a criticism of the, a criticism of the narrative that we are employing in discussing what, well, as you said, why it's going so bad, the, as bad as it is going now. So if you think about uh, Nassim Taleb's book, Anti-Fragile, there he says um, that there are things which are fragile. You put it into a big paper box and you put a sign on it saying, fragile, handle carefully. And there are those things which are anti-fragile. You shouldn't handle them carefully. In fact, you should handle them without any care, because they are enforced, they get better for the trial, for the testing. And I think our question in this panel is in a way, well, which kind of a thing the rule of law is? Is it fragile? Should it be handled with care? Or is it anti-fragile? Should it be tested and tried out? And should it get more robust by way of surviving the tests? And I think that in order to decide this question, in order to find out about the robustness of the rule of law, we should, in fact, um, think more, not about why it's getting so bad, but why it is sometimes really working quite well. So we should not only focus on the negative cases. And in thinking about this, I'm referring to my, my favorite and beloved sociologist, Norbert Elias, who was by no way a sociologist of law, but he did use a very useful concept. Uh, in German, it was Zustandsreduktion, a process reduction. And he thought, in sociology, we tend to reduce processes to states. So we tend to look at things as though they were static and stable. And I think this is what is happening with our thinking about the rule of law in many cases. We know that it is introduced and installed at some point. And this is a process, clearly. This is a process that Martin Krieger, to whom you referred to the, together with Adam Czarnota and, and Wojciech Sadurski, they studied the process of introducing the rule of law in Eastern Europe. And we have plenty of studies of this process. And then we have the studies by the very same authors, interestingly, and not much later on, of what is happening when the rule of law is being demolished and destabilized. Whatever happens in between seems to be more or less static, but it is also a process. The happening of the rule of law is also history. If it's working, it's working because there is a process, a historical process taking place. So I think we should focus on this process more. And this would, of course, mean that we would have to overcome our, well, our pessimistic inclination and head more maybe towards watching what was or is working well. And in this dissecting the processual logic of the rule of law, we might avoid the illusion of the rule of law being like a homeostatic default state, which does not require any explanation. It does require an explanation. And we do have some explanations on the macro level. And we have heard some excellent explanations in this conference already. Explanations pertaining to various, for example, yesterday's brilliant keynote on inequality levels. It's clearly relevant to the question. There are other brilliant explanations regarding the party system. Today's excellent panel on the book by, uh, edited by our colleagues here. And the macro level explanations are typically, at least to some extent, historical. What we are lacking, I think, is moving downwards. And here I'm making a bold statement, well, bold or not bold really, but at least a clear one. The rule of law is habitus dependent. The rule of law depends on the setup of the people, of individual people, the way they are thinking, reacting, they are feeling about law, about legal institutions, about the operations of the legal institutions. And 
this habit of dependence gets us in the well, right into the center of, con of the consideration of the relationship between history and the rule of law. Because the shortest definition of the habitus coming from the Dutch sociologist Hiseline de Kuypers is that habitus is congealed history. So habitus is the way in which the big structures and the historical experiences of communities get into our very way of thinking. And there is also a lot of work to be, uh, a lot of work has been done already in searching this link between how people think and how institutions and the rule of law are operating. But this research has, I think, up until now, been mostly presentist. So not really linking it to the historical experiences mediated by the symbolic communication using the resources gathered by the communities in the process of experiencing the pre-rule of law state, the installment of the rule of law, and the subsequent functioning of the rule of law, because rule of law has been functioning. It has been operational, and it's also an experience. So if you are thinking, and now let's get to the elephant in the room for a final point. If you are thinking, why is Polish constitutional tribunal deciding the way it is about the EU law? Well, it's a very legitimate question. But you should also ask why are other uh, courts in the EU, why are other legal systems in the EU, like the Icelandic system or the German system, deciding otherwise in very similar cases? Hearing that they have a faulty procedure for nominating judges, they just react by, okay, correcting it. They allow themselves to be corrected. Allowing ourselves to be corrected is a part of a habitus. It can be there, it can not be there. How did it get there? In order to know this, we need to have a historical explanation connecting the macro and the micro level. So this would be a very generalistic remark, but I think it, well, and I hope it can get us started on thinking about these questions. Thank you. Grace, I, I think it's really um extremely interesting um, introduction for our discussion and since today we have you know a couple of experts dealing with very um, very interesting cases such as eastern europe western europe france italy but also you as as a, as a um, bigger actor i think we can now move to discussing what we exactly mentioned in a kind of more um, precise cases so maybe let's move to to mark lazar and to um experience and and um practice we we can see the practice of resilience but maybe also practice of absorption um in in france or 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 italy mark the floor is yours thank you thank you so much for this invitation i'm sorry it was impossible for me to be in budapest uh, and i'm speaking from uh, paris um as you say, Barbara, uh, I have two elements and two precise in the introduction. I'm not a specialist, uh, of, I'm not a professor of law, but of political history and sociology, and I'm not specialist uh, of Central European countries, but uh, of France and Italy. But I will focus today uh, just uh, on the Italian case, uh, stressing four points, and I have first point to explain why uh, the choice of speaking about uh, Italy related to uh, the panel and related to uh, the, th uh, the thematic, the argument of the conference. Uh, why? Because uh, uh, I uh, would say that Italy is uh, what a, a very uh, an excellent political scientist, Italian one, Marco Tarchi say, Italy is a promised land of populism in Western Europe. And uh, uh, obviously, uh, I don't have the time uh, to give a, a definition, a precise definition of populism. We know that it's a term very complex and very confused, uh, but because we have just 10 minutes, uh, I would say that in the literature, in political science, for instance, in sociology, but also in history, we have three main conceptions of populism. Populism as an ideology, a thin ideology. This is, for instance, the idea of Kasmud, one of the best specialists of populism. Uh, populism as a strategy to uh, arrive in power or to be at the government, and populism as a style. Uh, for me, populism is a mix of these three uh, components, uh, but 
immediately we have to say that we have a big diversity of populism and especially uh, in Italy. Uh, Berlusconi, this is uh, maybe the great creator of a specific populism, the populism of a businessman who decide to do some politics and maybe we have, we could do many comparisons for with uh, Donald Trump in USA, for instance. Uh, the Lega, Lega Northern League, which was at the beginning uh, a populism, a regionalist populism, and would transform in a nationalist and far right populism. Uh, Brothers of Italy, Fratelli d'Italia in Italian, which is a populism coming from the fascist and neo-fascist history, but which is now more na nationalist and far right, not exactly uh, fascist. Five stars movement, very complicated uh, experience of a populist movement because it's quite impossible to classify in all the category of populism in Europe because it's neither of left and neither of left or left and right combinated. So uh, we have a great diversity of populism. And let's say uh, very quickly that Italy is this kind of primized uh, land of populism. This is the first part. Second point, maybe we have different populist movements and parties in Italy, uh, but they have a common point. And the common point is the illiberal dimension of this populist movement. Uh, all these populists present themselves as Democrats. And this is very important, Baba, you say, uh, we need to have an historical perspective. In a historical perspective, for instance, in Italy, if I just take the history of the Republic of Italy from 1946, when the Italian decided by referendum to choose the Republic to our days, we had by the past experiences of populist. Uh, uomo qualunque, so we could translate as a common man or any man just after the World War uh, Two, or for instance, the Maoist groups uh, in the 60s and the 70s. And the common point of this one, even they had very ideolo big ideological differences, were their will to destroy democracy and to uh, uh, create an authoritarian regime. Now, in Italy, as in many European countries, the populists themselves present as the best Democrats, but they are not liberal. They present themselves as a big and best Democrats, but they are not liberals. This is, for instance, a distinction uh, which, which has been done by Nadia Urbinati, uh, who is professor at Columbia University, in her book, which is called Me, the People. All the populists have an illiberal component because for them, there is just one cleavage between the people, good, virtuous, pure, against a small elite, homogeneous, who is accused to exercise a hard domination against the good people and to plot in permanence against the people. In these conditions, in this condition, the populists are uh, supposed to embody uh, the people. And for them, those who try to oppose to them are not legitimate. And they are not considered as adversaries, but as enemies. And also because this is a common point to the populist in Italy, but in my opinion, in other countries, uh, because they claim the necessity of the sovereignty of the people, but a sovereignty without limits, a sovereignty with no place for counter power, judicial or mediatic power, for instance. It means that all the populists, each populism has an illiberal and very often authoritarian dynamic and component. Uh, so this is an important point uh, and I will immediately try to uh, give an example because Barbara for the preparation of this panel say, give sometimes some experience and some experience or some uh, historical case. So I'm going, and this is a third point, to take an historical very recent example of what does it mean the challenge for democracy coming from this populist with the institution and with the rule of the law. You will remember maybe that in 2018, uh, the Five Stars Movement and the League, even if they were in competition during the electoral campaign, 
decided to do an alliance to try to govern together. And they succeed to do that. But just before that, they tried to form a first government with a professor of law, Giuseppe Conte, who was close to the Five Star Movement, but not exactly member of this party. And in, uh, in the 27th of May, 2018, Giuseppe Conte proposed the formation of the government to the president of the Republic, Sergio Mattarella. And what has been the reaction of the president of the Republic? He said, at the name of the Article 92 of the Constitution, I refuse the formation of this government because you decided to put as Minister of Economy a guy, the name is Paolo Savona, who explicitly wants to get out Italy from the Euro currency zona. And he said, if we do that, if I accept this government, that will be uh, that it will be a risk of break of the international treaties of Italy. What has been the reaction of the populist? The Lega say we're going to organize a walk on Rome, which was obviously an allusion of the walk to Rome in 1922 by Mussolini. The Five Star Movement say we're going to organize a constitutional impeachment, which does not exist in the constitution of Italy but which is very interesting. It was the argument they used to do. What did they say? They say Sergio Mattarella, the president of the Republic, has been elected in 2015 with the president, Chamber of Deputies and Senate. We won the elections. So we have the right to compose and to form the government as we want, because this is the sovereignty of the people. And the president of the Republic say, no, I'm sorry, there is a constitution and you have to respect the constitution. And they win. And uh, at the end, they decided, Five Star Movement and me, to propose another government. So I arrive at my four and last point. What are the reasons to be drawn? With the populists who are illiberal, it's a big challenge to the institution. But if the populist impacts the democracy, the opposite is also true. Democracies sometimes, at least in Italy, uh, considered generally as a weak democracy, has a capacity of resistance and resilience. But not only, they have a capacity of absorption of the challenge of the populist. Two examples, now the Five Stars Movement is completely divided with a component we want to be completely institutional. Good example, the foreign minister, Luigi Di Maio, who was an anti-European, is one of the most pro-European foreign minister you can see in Europe. And the league is now divided between a component who is with Mario Draghi at the government and a populist component who say, no, it's impossible to support government of Draghi. So this is a great lesson. Uh, we can have a capacity of absorption, acculturation of the populist and the liberal challenge. And why? But that is exactly what Martha said, is a result of a long history of building democracy and the process of the construction of the rule of law and the acceptation of the rule of law. Thank you so much for your attention. Thank you so much uh, for your intervention and this extremely interesting Italian um, examples. Um, I think this this case which you mentioned of 2018, I think it's really interesting, you know, example of militant democracy working in practice, which brings us, you know, to the question how this militant democracy can also affect the rule of law. In, in practice, especially in the EU members. Um, so maybe let's move to, to Petra right now, who is you know, working on different aspects, both of, of Hungary, but also EU response to what is happening uh, in, in, uh, in Hungary. But also she, she works on you know, the issue of mutual trust um, among, um, among EU states, but also among uh, different levels of EU institutions and domestic institutions. So Petra, do you have any kind of source of optimism for us when it comes, you know, looking for resilience and um, protection of the rule of law. 
Uh, thank you very much, Barbara, uh, for, for for these questions. Uh, I'm, I'm, I will try my best to be as optimistic as possible. Um, well, I, I, I do think that the good news is that European tradition does have a very specific meaning. I think Europeanness has a has an autonomous meaning. Uh, it is envisaged, as we all know, as a community of values, as a Wertegemeinschaft, a representative of a certain tradition. Uh, which is which is created for a for a humane and at the same time a viable legal order. So I think the rule of law is not just yet another narrative of of, of being European, but this is really it really has a special role for the European project, advancing the idea of constitutionalism, taming nationalism by reducing the risk of of, of yet another war. Um, so if I may use the, the language of Bill Kimlicka here, uh, far from transcending liberal nationhoods, the EU is universalizing it, reordering Europe in its own, in its image. Now, the, uh, the rule of law is, is not just important for, for the EU that, that you single out and for good reasons, but it's, it's, it's important for the whole European continent. This is inherent in all the articles of the European Convention on Human Rights and in the case law of the European Court of Human Rights since Balder versus the United Kingdom. Uh, but this is also important for, uh, for, the, uh, for, for the closer integration uh, Within, uh, within the smaller entity of the European Union. So the, the rule of law in the European Union um, has the same understanding in the ECHR, but also in the, in the, in the Court of Justice's uh, jurisprudence, at least since the seminal uh, verdict in Le Verts, where the court ruled that neither the EU institutions nor any of the member states are above the law. So together with some other overarching values, such as democracy and fundamental rights, they are really the basis of European integration and member states that voluntarily acceded to the EU and voluntarily signed um, the Lisbon Treaty freely promised to, to um, respect and, and to promote the rule of law. Now, I would like to talk a little about the scale of the rule of law decline. Uh, this is not going to be the most positive part of my, my presentation. Um, and then I will second guess why the EU is not responding properly uh, to, um, to what is happening in some of the member states. And we have just heard um, a, a, an excellent presentation uh, of, of, of one example, uh, but there are several member states um, queuing up uh, for uh, for the title of rule of law violator. And then we, I, I will try to show that um, the EU, if it wanted to, uh, would have the tools actually uh, to, relax, uh, to react. So the scale of the rule of law de uh, decline is, is rather heavy. So the EU is now harboring member states that are no constitutional democracies anymore. It's not me saying that this is the varieties of democracy, according to which Hungary is simply not a democracy anymore. According to Freedom House, Hungary is not a free country. If you look at Bertelsmann Stiftung's um, rule of law or transformation index, you will see that Hungary and, and, and Poland are doing um, uh, very badly in terms of the rule of law. If you look at the World Justice Project's rule of law index, you will see that, that these two countries are the worst among all EU, AFTA, and North American uh, countries explored. Whichever um, slot you are looking at, whether you are looking at the constraints on governmental powers, open government, fundamental rights, regulatory enforcement, civil justice, you name them. So now, of course, no state is immune from individual violations of the rule of law and related values, but I think we must distinguish sporadic issues from systemic rule of law decline. And in the countries that I, um, that I singled out now, um, um, the governments, they introduced blueprints, as, as professors Shapeland and Fash pointed out, that systematically weaken, annihilate, and capture internal checks on power, entrenching the long-term rule of the dominant party. Now, this is an EU matter. This is an EU matter for various reasons. On the one hand, because um, 
you know, when we acceded to the European Union in 2004, we expected the EU to be yet another check, an external form of militant democracy that ensures that uh, transition to democracy is a one-way road and no U-turn can be taken, but also for, for more direct reasons, such as, for example, um, uh, people or MEPs that are not elected in a fair manner to the European Parliament will delegitimize the whole uh, lawmaking process of the European Union, or you will see that um, rule of law violations become contagious and they are spreading across the European Union, or what Barbara was just referring to in her introductory, uh, the, uh, the, uh, the rule of law is uh, specifically very important for EU law, not just for the European project as a whole, but also specifically for EU law, because there is a number of presumptions and, and legal institutions that are based on the presumption that every state, every member state is a state based of, or, or, on the rule of law, and every individual will get a fair trial by an independent judiciary. Now, if this is not the case, um, the whole system kind of collapses. It might collapse uh, as it happened yesterday with regard to Poland, then a constitutional court uh, just declares certain um, provisions of, uh, of the EU treaties to be contrary to the Polish constitution. Um, or uh, even if it doesn't happen, um, a decline, for example, with regard to judicial independence will make other countries, the democratic countries, be suspicious uh, of, of, of quasi-authoritarian countries. And they will, for example, not cooperate in the criminal justice field with them because judges from democratic countries just don't want to become complicit in human rights violations by ex extraditing, surrendering uh, suspects to a country where they might potentially not get a fair trial by an independent judiciary. So this is absolutely existential for the EU to react and it failed to do so. And I was just wondering why it failed to do so. And one answer is given by, uh, by, another, uh, by another panel, uh, the one discussing Professor Shio's most recent book, Ruling by Cheating, uh, where he claims that an illiberal democracy, or as he puts it, a plebiscitarian leader democracy, or borrowing from Max Weber, he also says, Pura Demokratie doesn't have a very good connotation for a European uh, scholar. Um, so such a, such a leader will do everything to conceal the true authoritarian tendency of the regime. Such a regime is, is necessarily based on a theory of cheating in its constitutional law, whether these are straightforward lies, deceit, fraud, fraud or tricks, uh, cheating uh, is, is an integral element. So a regime, according to Professor Shio, that cheats in its use of the law, breaches a promise of truth or authenticity that the underlying rules of the game will be observed. Now, cheating can be observed in relation to all European values, but this is very, very apparent with regard to the rule of law. Uh, being a rule of law violator, of course, is a great stigma. So value infringements all have a veneer of legality. Relying on this theory of cheating, they seem to be embedded. All these mischiefs seem to be embedded in legal, legal rules. So instead of admitting what these regimes are actually doing, namely changing the laws and institutions with the sole aim of retaining power and money, illiberal governments make efforts to mix legality with the rule of law and argue that everything they do is legal. So the, the, the names that are invented for these regimes are already oxymorons themselves. And they show the, the, this cheating tendency of these regimes. I think about oxymorons such as constitutional populism or even more abusive constitutionalism. So in such regimes, the constitutional court is compromised. The most experienced judges are removed from the top courts. The ombudsman system as we knew it ceases to exist. Media pluralism is not there. Academic freedom is, is curtailed. I don't need to emphasize this in this setting. Uh, there is a shrinking space for NGOs, human rights defenders are stigmatized, vulnerable minorities are scapegoated, and even the thinnest understanding of the rule of law is not respected, because according to international uh, observers, elections, at least in my country, which is Hungary, used to be um, still free, but not fair anymore in 2018 and before. 
Now, the same thing can be traced with regard to other values that are connected to the rule of law, such as fundamental rights. Um, so, for example, there is a constant state of emergency that is being introduced because allegedly you need a different allocation of, 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 of liberties and security in times of emergency. So this is constantly upheld or state aims are reframed in the rights language so that you don't need to use, you mustn't use the original tests for rights infringements but rights infringements are presented as a clash of rights. Just to give you an example, an anti-LGBTI law is justified on the premise that this is a law for the protection of the rights of the children, right? Now, uh, as I said, um, this is, this is a, a, a matter for the European Union and I just participated um, two weeks ago at a conference where, um, which took place under Chatham uh, rules, so I can't say much about who said this, but the representative of the commission said, you know, this ruling, ruling by cheating era is over. Now we, uh, uh, we, we see what is happening on the ground and we must react forcefully. Now, if, this, if, if, if uh, the institutions can see what is happening on the ground, uh, then of course they, uh, they shouldn't hide, uh, be, hide between an alleged lack of powers, lack of tools, they shouldn't just invent new soft law tools um, in the pretense of doing something against rule of law backsliding uh, because they already have the tools available that could make the European Union act as an ex external form of militant democracy. And I don't have the monitoring or benchmarking tools or the discussion or the platforms for discussion in mind, like Article 7.1, which is a lex imperfecta. It doesn't have a, a sanction, right? If we can move to the sanctioning prong of Article 7, but it in itself is just a platform for a dialogue. What I mainly mean is the sanctioning prong of Article 7, but even more infringement procedures and the conditionality regulation, which could be used as, um, um, as dissuasive tools uh, to, to make um, the autocratic countries depart uh, from, from the path they have uh, been taken in the recent past. Now, I would be very open to discuss the tools available if we have time. If not, there will be two excellent panels in a follow-up workshop that explores uh, these instruments. So let me just reiterate that I believe that violations and in particular systemic, systemic attacks on the rule of law in Europe have direct consequences for the European idea and more specifically for European Union law. I do believe that there is a, an existential importance for the EU to react and contain such problems. Um, and I do believe that the EU um, has all the tools necessary um, to respond if uh, the tools available are used promptly and in a coordinated manner. Um, in such a case, the EU could provide efficient responses to rule of law backsliding or at the very minimum, slow down the destruction that is happening or at the very, very minimum, put an end to the absurdity of financing governments, building regimes in violation of, uh, of EU values out of EU money. So thank you very much. Thank you, Petra. I think you provide quite broad spectrum of, of optimism, starting, you know, from minimum to very, very minimum, which gives still kind of, you know, a, a, a big field of discussion and, and possibilities, as far as I remember the European Commission after yesterday ruling is concerned about the situation. Uh, so we are still waiting how much minimum of concern will be applied in practice. But we just, uh, in fact, entered the EU stage, which is extremely interesting, also comparing to what uh, Mark said before with, with Italian case. If, and if you remember the Berlusconi stage and EU attempts to react on political and a lot, little bit of also uh, ju uh, judicial level, we, saw, I can, we, we can see that EU has not learned the lesson so far. And now, um, the test and the exam with the, with the Poland and Hungary is much more difficult. But as you mentioned, um, uh, Petra, there was this belief in, in, uh, in Central European states that uh, EU will be this external check, um, kind of Prince Charming, um, helping you know, with, with any problems with democracy and the rule of law. And there is 
there is EU, there is a stage, there is forum discussion, and in fact, nothing really happens. So if we may move now to, to Kolia, why is it so? Why it's so difficult for the EU to um, to make those decisions that Petra mentioned, even those very, very minimum ones? Thank you very much. And uh, thank you for having me on the panel. It's difficult to speak um, as the last panelist, obviously, and Petra, um, but also um, the other colleagues have raised so many points. So let me indeed focus on the question, why is it so difficult for the EU to respond? Um, on the one hand, of course, we can say that the EU has a normative uh, character as a treaty-based policy, uh, which is founded on the principles of democracy, human rights, and the rule of law. Um, but there are systematic challenges to these principles that can be indeed, as Petra has already mentioned, uh, understood as posing existential threats to the viability and the continuance of the EU as a political and legal order. So the EU as a polity. Um, the Well, the problem that arises with that is basically a crisis of identity of the EU. Um, it is a crisis of compliance. Um, Petra has mentioned it. It has an effect on uh, the law, on European law, but also the question how can actually European law be implemented on the level of the member states. And it is not only a question of implementation, but also of perception. What is the perception of the European Union as it stands towards the outside world? Um, so then, with all of that in mind, the question is, why does the EU struggle? If it is so clear that there is a crisis to respond to rule of law backsliding, de-democratization, or as some people call it, de-consolidation. And the point, I think, is furthermore that this is a very risky path that the EU is on. The EU aims to remain being considered as a raw model of regional integration, linking market integration with supranationalism and democracy that serves as an example to the world. But for how long? Right? So, moreover, it's a risky path because we know that Europe has the evidence of democracy not as a strong form of government, but as a vulnerable one, as a fragile one. And history has told us many lessons about that. So democratic, de democratic transformation has its limits, and the EU is on a risky path. In essence, then, the EU struggles, I argue, because of an inherent nexus between European integration on the one hand and democracy on the other. That is, that is the point that I would like to make. European integration and democracy have often been seen as two different and yet separate, intrinsically connected aspects of the EU as a polity. On the one hand, we have European integration, the functional integration of the European markets, and the famous saying of Schumann, obviously, Europe will not be made at once. So we have to wait functional integration step by step. Democracy and other uh, principles and values were, according to Davies, for example, condemned to instrumentality in that context. And yet, as Petra and others have reminded us time and again, over time, the EU has emerged as a community of values. It's not only about functional integration, it's also a community of values, linking the integration process with the principles of the rule of law, human rights, and democracy. So, there is a link. Uh, there is a link between integration and democracy. And there are positive effects for the EU to have both on board. EU integration provides democracies, EU democracies, member state democracies, with options to overcome boundary-related problems. For example, in times of globalization, only the European Union can stem these problems. The member states can't do that on their own. At the same time, EU integration requires 
democratic decision-making processes to legitimize its processes, both on the European level and also in the member states. The EU aims to remain being considered a laboratory of regional integration and democracy. But the problem is that, in fact, there is an unfinished political project falling short of competences to regulate the quality of democracy, to regulate the quality of human rights in the European Union. There is simply a lack of competence. Now, we can argue it's a community of values, but very often human rights and democracy are reference points rather than competences for the European Union. And that has an impact on how the European Union views democracy and human rights related issues at home. I'm talking about the internal side of things. So the challenge that the EU faces lies precisely in the middle of this tension, tension relationship between democracy and integration. The rule of law, democracy, and the EU survival as a community of values on the one hand, and the EU's integration ethos, as some member states do not only backslide, they also move into the direction of disintegration. So what are the options? And I will just give you two options, and they are more theoretical, they are more conceptual, and the lawyers will not uh, obviously always um, perhaps agree, because they are really um, based on conceptual uh, understanding. So one option is, how can the EU respond? One option is winning back credibility. The consequence may be to move on with democratic uh, integration, leaving, in fact, failing states behind, advancing to levels of, for example, differentiated integration. In the absence of a sanction, which would allow the EU to abandon member states from the project altogether. So basically, those member states that are willing to proceed are going in a direction that others will not be willing to follow. It's differentiated integration. The downside is that at that moment, the EU will need to admit that integration did not advance democracy and that integration has even moved on without democracy for quite some time. And EU actors may want, however, to pursue this option to underline the value of democracy even if uh, they, uh, even if it doesn't render integrationist dynamics altogether. The second option is keep on going. Keep the respective member states on board, for example, by introducing sanctions and necessary readjustments, label the actual de-democratization in, in a less vocal way. In fact, that's what the EU institutions are doing right now, right? We're not talking about de-democratization officially in the EU. And it is important to divert the impression that integration and democracy no longer walk hand in hand. So the upside of that option is you protect the integrative nature of the EU, which could result in what Dawson has defined as strategies of bracketing or accommodation. Potentially contagious member states are held within the institutional setup rather than being alienated and possibly uncontrolled. EU actors, I argue, will want to keep the unity of the project and its functional purpose, keeping backsliding member states from leaving the EU's broader sphere of influence and reach. I think that second option will always be the preferred option when we look into what is empirically happening on the ground. And I come to the end by saying, given the EU's overarching functional approach to integration, the EU's response is indeed likely to be one leaning towards integration always, rather than towards democracy and or the pr protection of democracy. The latter argument, I think, allows us to explain why the EU may prioritize an integration path, despite the evidence of backsliding scripts and despite the historical evidence of democracy as a fragile rather than a strong form of government in Europe. So I close here with that remark.
Thank you, Kolya. So much of optimism. Thank you. Uh, but you also mentioned, I think, something that Marta mentioned in, in, in the beginning, meaning this fragile nature of, 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 the, of the EU governments. So if we could now move to very short replies, like one, two minutes of each speaker, and starting probably with, with Marta, my only question would be, is it like the, the EU rule of law, which is fragile, or maybe the attack on the rule of law is so fragile that the EU institutions cannot touch it because you know it's too fragile to, to react? Would it be the latter? Uh, oh, yes, uh, just to react very, very briefly, uh, I, I, I do agree with, with Kolya's assessment of the situation, but I would just point out one thing it, regarding also fragility and anti-fragility of the rule of law and the European governance in this respect. Well, if you take the rational choice kind of view, well, cheating can be a winning strategy. You know, cheating, and then referring to Petra's remarks, cheating is definitely a winning strategy in this kind of setting. You are not being, you know, sanctioned for cheating in a way that would discourage you from cheating. And with Hungary, you are entering the second decade of successful cheating that way. No. So, of course, well, I do not want to get into this game theory logic. I, I don't find it convincing at all. But... If you take it as a metaphor, where if the players are cheating and they are getting away with it, how does it impact the other players in the game? This is a multilateral kind of game. And then you find out, okay, these guys have been cheating constantly and are none the worse for that. That's, that's one question, I think. And I think I will leave it at that. Thank you. Great, thank you. Uh, Mark, would you like to reply to, to, to other speakers? No, thank you so much for Petra, uh, to Petra and all, yeah, very interesting points, but I was thinking, and this is just a point to discuss together, uh, if we see all the social survey we have on the public opinion in Europe, uh, I think we see uh, two contradictory uh, tendencies. The first one uh, is uh, uh, more or less 33 to 35% of the Europeans say now that maybe there is another possibility of regime than democracy. So it's a motive, it's a real preoccupation. But on the other side, we have a quite high support of uh, European Union, maybe as it has been said, as European integration, and especially, uh, and I think we have to integrate that, after the COVID-19, I mean, this is maybe a turning point for European Union. I would like to know, what do you think about that? Because uh, uh, in July to, uh, of last year, it has been decided by the European Council of the Recovery Fund. And it's uh, uh, enormous uh, and a big change of the European Union. And when I see, for instance, uh, in Italy and France, two countries very uh, real skeptical uh, in Western European countries, something is changing. I mean, there is a, a real support and a, quite a new trust in European Union. So the challenge is maybe we have a turning point of the public opinion and how to combine maybe uh, this change with the necessity of more democratization of European Union. This is uh, the question I would like to discuss and to I wanted to share with you. Thank you, Mark. Petra? Thank you, thank you for, for the follow-up uh, comments and thank you, Barbara, for the question. Uh, I have two very straightforward uh, answers to you. First of all, the European institutions and member states perhaps uh, were not prepared for what was coming uh, with this uh, turning to, to illiberalism and authoritarianism. So Article 7 was never um, drafted to be employed. Uh, infringement procedures were never um, thought to be tools in the fight for the rule of law. And actually for quite a long time, the commission had a very conservative stance on whether uh, it can be invoked or not in relation to article two, or as a matter of fact, article 19 TEU um, uh, problems, I mean, problems relating to judicial independence. Now we see uh, that, that, that the toolbox is there and, and the existing tools can be used uh, creatively and dissuasively, uh, but for a very long time, it, it, it wasn't the case. Uh, the second, uh, the second um, 
answer has already been stated by me. I think uh, the problem with the liberals is that they speak the language of constitutional democracy. So when, uh, when, 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 when reference to conferral of powers is made, when reference to national sovereignty is made, when reference to constitutional identity or national security is made as some justifications to override European Union law, these are existing things and these and, and decent debates and very valid points can be made um, uh, with regard to that if you speak the language of constitutional democracy. Now, the problem is that it's very difficult to, uh, to have a dialogue with someone who doesn't speak the language of constitutional democracy and uses these legal instruments and concepts uh, in an abusive way. And perhaps if I if I just may very quickly to make a third point in all incomplete constitutional regimes, and I think Qualia, you, you, you made this point that the EU is one in all incomplete constitutional regimes, it's the court that plays a huge, crucial role. Just think about the Strasbourg court that has a very crucial role in interpreting human rights. Same thing goes for the Court of Justice of the European Union. Nevertheless, I think for the future, the Court of Justice must not be left alone as it happened until now. And the political institutions and also the member states, democratic member states who are friends of the rule of law must play a much greater role in upholding the rule of law and in designing uh, and invo invoking um, instruments that can, be, um, can provide responses to rule of law violations. Thank you. Thank you, Petra, especially this point about the, the language of, of the Constitution. I had the, the exact the same feeling yesterday when listening to oral uh, reasoning of, of the Polish tribunal, but I also had the feeling that they were saying not we the court, but we the government. And we'll see in the written reasoning how much government of the, uh, is implied in this, uh, in this reasoning. Kolia, would you like to reply? Yeah, perhaps... Um, perhaps uh... I, I pick up what, what Mark has said uh, because uh, he started that conversation and I think it's a really interesting one. I think we have to look at the cleavages. We have to look at um, how we can actually look at European societies, right? But also European society at large. What is, so to speak, the the future of that European society and what will, let's call it the next generation wish to be the government, uh, the form of government that it is actually under. And I think there are huge cleavages um, that we see and we need to study them uh, much more. On the one hand, um, what we may call cosmopolitans, cosmopolitan values, but also the question for sustainability. Uh, we see youth movements that are as active as never before, um, that will have a certain idea about the form of government they want to be, they want to be uh, working with in the future. And on the other hand, we see um, uh, uh, of course, people who are struggling, who are also struggling because of the uh, effects of European integration, which has unfortunately not turned out to be an opportunity for everybody. So we need to think about how can we actually bring those on board that are very easily convinced by alternative forms of government because they are left out, because they are rather tending to be actually supporting uh, what you may uh, rather call indeed illiberal ideas and non-democratic forms of government. So we need to think about how this can be done in Europe at large. And I think this is really to the sociologists um, to, to give us some answers. Thank you. Uh, I think we managed to um, gather a couple of questions already, but I think now we can move to to audience pr present now here in uh, in Budapest. Would you like to ask question, give a comment, and first introduce yourself if that's possible? Please, Balash. Thanks. Uh, I have one and a half questions. I mean, what about illiberal or anti-liberal rule of law? Yes, I mean, like historically, we also know that there are examples like Bismarck's Germany would be probably a good example, but like more uh, in a contemporary context, like when we are thinking about 
re-democratization, like in the Hungarian case. I mean, it might very easily uh, emerge next year that there will be an opposition that is trying unconstitutionally to dismantle an illiberal constitution and the defenders of the rule of law and the constitution will be people who are actually cheating through uh, this uh, all this time, but now they will actually claim that they are defending the rule of law. And uh, and uh, what do you do with that? And the second, uh, the half question is is about um, how uh, how to evaluate another elephant in the room before the Polish elephant, and that's the German elephant, of course. I mean, like this whole uh, overruling of the European uh, uh, system, legal system by. National constitutional courts, of course, didn't start with Poland. It started with Germany, and that uh, undermines, to a certain extent, this beautiful and convenient picture of rogue states and normal democracies. Yes, I mean, after all, the Polish constitutional court uh, could easily use arguments that were actually invented by the German one. And as we know, the German former head of the constitutional court said that when they were ruling what they were ruling, they couldn't care less for what the international implications of that might be. So I think that's, a, I think, a much more complicated situation than just the rogue states using this against the nice democratic. Yeah. Um, Laszlo? I truly appreciate the work of lawyers who uh, fight for these rules. Uh, so uh, I truly appreciate the work of lawyers who fight for this cause uh, at the European level. But as a political sociologist, I would like to go to the level of member states. More uh, uh, from the perspective Dan Kellerman uh, uh, sees these kinds of reasons. What are the incentives of uh, policymakers at the EU level? And uh, I cannot be just to very briefly. Uh, they are primarily uh, uh, shaped or uh, actually, I would say uh, uh, solely shaped by domestic politics. Uh, 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 you already mentioned Germany. Uh, uh, in general, the core country's uh, incentives is uh, are shaped, or the preferences are shaped by f first domestic interest groups, uh, and the other is uh, uh, the outcomes of domestic political uh, competition. To what extent these kind of issues get salient, uh, are politicized, and. Uh, until uh, uh, these uh, questions are not politicized in uh, the core countries, until that primarily the domestic interest groups shape uh, the preferences of these actors. So uh, in the case of Germany, the auto industry and uh, others uh, are the dominant players, and they are interested in maintaining the status quo and not really uh, uh, moving uh, things in the uh, situation that can endanger the interest. So, uh, you ask for uh, for some positive things. I think the most important thing might be politicizing these issues uh, at uh, in the core countries, trying to raise that. Uh, 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 there are different ways one can do that. That uh, they are cheating with your tax uh, money, uh, taxpayers' money, or something like that. But until that happens, uh, uh, you will, guys, uh, at uh, in Brussels fight. I mean, you lawyers, I think, uh, tough. Uh, fight. Thanks a lot. Thank you. Would anyone else like to ask or comment, agree or disagree with the speakers? Dimitri. Uh, that's a wonderful panel. I'm Dimitri Kochner from the Democracy Institute. Uh, and my question concerns the dialogue between uh, between the courts involved and between the political forces involved. How far can you engage in that with uh, with those whom you consider liberal or who is uh, whom you consider anti-rule uh, of law guys? Uh, could the Italian example where there was actually a conversation between the president and the and the ministers to be who failed to 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 take the the position? Uh, a great example of a dialogical resolution of uh, potentially uh, dead end uh, rule of law situations. Thank you. Please, Peter. <clears throat> I'm Peter Molnar, and I just two quick points. One is that last look, we had the uh, chairman of the current Hungarian parliament just said two days ago in an interview that and that uh, those who argue that simple majority will be enough to to fix their basic law uh, engage in a criminal act. So that's just an example what Balaj mentioned. And, and also I would like to underline what Balaj said about the German example. 
I think it's really important, and I would like to ask your comments on that, to to come out from the simplified and to, what, to some extent distorted picture that the issue, issue is only that there are some backwards places in Europe and they are so so bad and otherwise so so it's really important to reflect on similar or somewhat similar issues in 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 other countries and the leading countries as well thanks thank you yes hello uh, i'm michael schutzen from the us so i'm outside of the eu uh, uh, discussions um, and learned a lot from from this panel um, I was taken with uh, Petra's remark that Europeanness has uh, a, a long-standing meaning uh, that incorporates notions of uh, human rights that goes well beyond the institutional uh, integration, and um, that made me uh, reminded me of how struck I am just walking around. Budapest to see EU flags um, uh, quite prominently. It, you know, we have no such thing uh, in the US. Uh, there's the US flag and that's the world. Um, um, but the, in the, the US, I, I noticed that um, e even for um, at the elite level, even say in the, the news media, um, uh, we talk about democracy and we don't so much talk about liberal democracy. We don't talk so much about constitutional democracy. And the, and I don't think the general public understands, and uh, in, in, I'm talking about the U.S. or I don't think the general public understands that democracy as um, you're talking about it here, as I think about it myself, uh, uh, has to incorporate some notion of of uh, human rights and the rule of law. Um, uh, so the, the, the question is, um, uh, what, what do you think that the understanding of uh, democracy is uh, uh, among European, the various European peoples? And, and um, is, is the whole question of the rule of law pretty remote from uh, what most people understand. Thank you. Uh, we have uh, 17 minutes left by the end of the, of the of the panel, so I guess we'll move to questions. We have plenty uh, to answer. Sorry, we already had questions. So we have, I think, food for thought and a couple of you know, points of reference when it comes to comments. Maybe let's start with Kolya and then we'll move backwards. Sorry. I forgot that I had my own microphone. Sorry. Um, I would like to pick up uh, perhaps two of, of the aspects that, that have been mentioned. Uh, the one is the, the question about what, what Lajlo has said about politicization and depoliticization. And of course, uh, we can perhaps speculate whether um, government changes may also lead to politicization, at least in some member states. Um, and I'm talking about my own country Germany, where we currently have a new, so to speak, government in the making. And the question is what will eventually arrive if that new government should be able to um, form itself. Uh, and it may be a different government, um, a, a very different government, also in the tone towards what we are seeing in Europe. Um, when you think about the coalition between the Social Democrats, the Greens, and the Liberals um, uh, compared to the Grand Coalition under uh, Angela Merkel and also uh, the sister party, the CSU, which always had very good connections, obviously, to, to the Fidesz party. So I think it's very important that we look also at some of these dynamics and how government changes on the member state level can perhaps lead to politicization. I would argue that in Germany, this case indeed has perhaps even had deep politicized um, effects uh, and how that may spill over into the making of what we may see in the council 
um, what we may see in the European Council and also the effects that this may have on European uh, responses overall. So I'm, 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 I'm interested in, in these kind of dynamics. On the question of the German constitutional court, I would say, you know, if I had to explain it from a non-legal perspective, I would say this is an old conflict between the German constitutional court and actually um, uh, Luxembourg. Uh, and I think, to be perfectly honest with you, that the, um, that the decision uh, of the German constitutional court was entirely made in that, con in, the, in that context of a conflict between who can interpret uh, the European law and, and how far can uh, Luxembourg go. But there is a spillover effect into other conflicts, and that's the problem. I think the, the connection between the different levels of conflict um, should be much more actually recognized by the courts, which obviously don't see themselves as political actors, but they are uh, from a non-legal perspective, I would say these, obviously, these constitutional courts are political actors as well, and they should also self-perceive th themselves as such, but I don't think they necessarily do. Thank you. It was really interesting yesterday to listen to the Polish Constitutional Tribunal when they refer to the Polish sovereignty using the ruling of the German court. So I, I find this really extremely logically challenging, but it was really fascinating. Let's move to Petra. Would you like to pick a couple of questions and, and yeah, answer them? I'd just pick some because there were many, many interesting and of course we could continue this debate for hours. I, I also think this was very interesting. I followed the, the hearing yesterday, Barbara, uh, your, your kind uh, colleagues just translated what was happening and I also found it intriguing how they are actually borrowing from the Karlsruhe court on the one hand and how uh, the constitutional tribunal goes into the populist rhetoric. So it's not just repeating what the government is saying but it's really turning into who are you representing asking the deputy ombudsman are you on the side of the polish people or who are you representing i mean that was really unusual from a constitutional court uh, but coming to the questions from the audience i think Bar uh, balaj and, and and peter asked the million dollar question how you can uh, uh, um, change the constitution that uh, uh, that uh, hungary currently has uh, with a, with a um, uh, simple majority, uh, whereas the constitution doesn't allow it to be changed by a simple majority. And I don't want to enter this very interesting debate that is among constitutional lawyers. Of course, you could also raise the question whether the fundamental law was initially adopted according to the rules, because there was this indirectly, at least, this four-fifth um, constitutional majority requirement, which was scrapped by a two-third majority. It's not very elegant to scrap a four-fifth uh, majority requirement by a two-third majority. I always tend to say that it's like as if you would uh, scrap in the eternity clause uh, by a two-third majority from the German constitution. Now, obviously, this would be unthinkable. Um, but also, um, I, I think um, the, 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 what I see from the proposals and one, what I, I, I find important is that it's, it's thematized. So now this is not a discourse anymore among constitutional lawyers, but I think political actors uh, uh, understand that they just cannot govern uh, with this constitutional foundation that is now there. And uh, I also adhere to, to the model where there is a public debate and there is potentially at some point in time, but of course it cannot happen in a rush as it happened with fundamental law. Um, there is a public debate and, and, and there is also a confirmation of the constitutional text by the people. Uh, but of course, I don't have uh, I don't have a single uh, answer to uh, to your to your most pressing uh, question uh, that you that you have just asked. Um, and um, well, as long as as we, you don't have a debate, Michael, in the United States about a constitutional democracy, I would say that's a good that's a good um, that's a good sign. 
uh, because it would mean that that's not an issue. You know, it becomes an issue. I mean, th there is this bon mot, and as long as as everything is fine, uh, the rule of law is a little bit like air. You don't notice that it's all around you, but once it disappears, you start to notice it, and, and you start to debate about it. Um, I um, I think that um, um, the whole debate started really with uh, uh, with the backsliding states uh, where, where where member states started to realize that that something is um, um, something is deteriorating in some parts of Europe and it has a consequence for them. But I would also say that people uh, don't ordinary people don't necessarily realize it to an extent that they should. So, uh, the key, I think, is to involve more uh, the democratic element, as many of you have pointed out, and to involve more uh, the people who are, uh, who, are, who are voting in their own governments. And this is already happening to some extent, but not to the extent uh, as it happens uh, in the member state setting. So just remember in 2020, um, in, a, in, a, in a Landes election in Germany, um, there was a politician voted in who just had to resign within 24 hours because he got the support, he got elected with the support of, the, of a um, radical right wing uh, party. And everyone, so it's including Angela Merkel, CDU, CSU, the Social Democrats, SPD, everyone said that this is not to be forgiven that the person from a democratic party is voted in with the support of AFD. Uh, now, such a thing would never happen uh, in the European Union, or at least we are not there. And this is moving to, uh, to Laszlo's question, actually. Um, the, the issue, the, the problem, I think, it, is that it's not there. Um, um, I don't want to get too personal, but the but the president of the current commission was voted in with the support of uh, of two illiberal regimes, and she seems to have made some concessions um, in order to uh, in order to get the support of these two governments. So, for example, the Hungarian commissioner just got the portfolio um, uh, where he oversees the rule of law and media freedom and the state of civil society uh, in third countries. So exactly issues um, um, that, that are deteriorating in Hungary, which is quite absurd. Uh, but uh, she got the support of the Hungarian government and for that matter also of the Polish government. I think um, they got agriculture, which they lobbied for. Um, and, and, and no one had any concerns, quite to the contrary, it was presented in the European Union as a great win, as a wonderful compromise. Uh, so I think as long as the citizens uh, in the individual member states don't see it as a problem, um, things will not change. And now I see there is a silver lining and Barbara expressly called us to be a little positive. And I see this uh, now with the with some governments at least toying with the idea uh, of initiating uh, infringement procedures if the Commission fails to do so. So um, at least the Dutch government and I, I think also the Finnish government and other governments were toying with the idea of initiate Article 259 procedures, as suggested by Professor Kochenov, for example. Um, um, in the literature um, to, um, um, to make uh, the illiberal countries return to the path uh, of the rule of law. I think this, is, this should be seen as a, as a wake up call for the commission because normally it's not the member states that should be forced into a diplomatic conflict, but it's the commission that is supposed to be the guardian of the treaties, including article two on European values. So once uh, such a member state starts such a proceeding, I would suggest the commission to immediately take over the case and press on with it. Now, I was at the conference where the commission representative said, that's a big no-no for them. On the one hand, because the member states shouldn't force the commission or shouldn't tell the commission what the commission should do. And second, because, um, because the member states should also take a responsibility in enforcing the rule of law. I think these arguments are rather shaky because it's not the, the, the role of the member states to, to, uh, to enforce uh, uh, the treaties, but it's the role of, uh, of the European Union, uh, European Union's executive, uh, namely the commission. But I do think that the member states could 
would just push uh, uh, certainly uh, the um, the institutions to to make that move, uh, and I, I I do see the citizens dissatisfaction driving the governments towards this, even if it is only uh, about the money. Let's not build illiberal regimes out of taxpayers' money in other countries, because this is not uh, this is not our idea of the European Union. And this is not what we pay our taxes for. Even even if 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 you follow this thin line, that would already give a push uh, to the member states. <laughs> Thank you, uh, Petra. Now let's move to Mark. I, I saw that we had some connection problems with, with Mark. There were a couple of questions, and one of was asked by, by Laszlo. It seemed to be first painful for a lawyer, but he argues that you know politicizing issues of domestic groups might be a way of solution. And the more I listen to you, I tend to agree with him more. So, Mark, would you like to evaluate, uh, elaborate on this one? I'm going to be very brief because I had the problem, I had to leave you during 15 minutes. So at the moment of the question, because and to get out of my office, because we had an exercise of emergency alert for the fire and we had to leave. So I'm really sorry I was uh, uh, by the street during 15 minutes in the cold. Uh, so I just hear um, uh, one of the last question by an American colleague, if I'm not wrong, and I found it very interesting, uh, this question about the level of understanding, and we could say also the level of knowledge of the Constitution. And again, uh, uh, I, I find that the Italian case is very interesting, and I go completely against the mainstream of interpretation by political science in the history, because the mainstream is to say that uh, democracy, Italian democracy is fragile, it's a weak, uh, there is a lack of uh, civic culture. But in the opposite, I see that it has been a very long and permanent work of pedagogy uh, by the institution, by the past, by the main parties, Christian democracy, even the Italian Communist Party, in my knowledge of the Communist Party of Western European countries, it's the only Communist Party who decided to do a permanent reference to the Constitution. That has never been the case in the French Communist Party. And you knew that in France and Italy, we had the most powerful Communist parties of Western European countries. Never the French Communist Party referred to the Constitution, Fourth Republic One or Fifth Republic. On the opposite, the Communist Party always referred to the democratic constitution, saying that it's a real important element of the political culture, not only of the country, but also for the left. And I think there is a legacy of that. Uh, and that's the reason why uh, this constitution, uh, the level of knowledge of the constitution is quite good. It's a program, for instance, in the school. And I'm very struck by the fact that so many students, for instance, Italian ones, are able to quote some articles of the constitution. And I have to say that the French students at Sciences Po are unable to quote at least one article of the constitution of the French Republic. And this is a big difference with the Italian students we have here. So I think it has been a real work and a, a, a kind of assimilation, even again, by uh, some populist parties now. And maybe this explains why the most important popularity, when you see the level of popularity in the polls, we have very low level of popularity and trust for the political parties, highest level for the presidents of the Republic, not for the personage of the president of the Republic, but for the institution as a guarantee of the unity of the nation and as a guarantee of the respect of the constitution. So that was my answer to this uh, colleague. I'm sorry for the way because I did not hear the questions. Thank you, Mark. In case, you know, this um, emergency fire uh, exercise makes us disconnected, thank you for being as, uh, with us and thank you for your time and input. It was really great to, to listen to um, to those examples. Now let's move uh, to Marta. Thank you. And uh, just very briefly to the last question, you know, there is a Center for Public Opinion Research in Warsaw and the Center traditionally asks the same questions like in, at fixed intervals. Uh, what is your opinion on the functioning of democracy in Poland? And, you know, after 2015, it actually improved. So the people's opinion was getting better. It, it wasn't, you know, enthusiastic, but it was getting better. Whereas the democracy, of course, was doing worse and worse. And this is one very brief piece of 
small piece of evidence to uh, well uh, to provide support for to, for what you are saying. Of course, we do not really speak about democracy in the way people are thinking about democracy. So getting down to the level of uh, of the societies, of the member states, and I very much support Laszlo's point about politicizing these issues. And I won't elaborate on that, we are out of time now, but there is one very interesting strategy that is being employed by the anti-governmental opposition. This is moving some questions, for example, the question of Poland's adherence to the European Union, the applicability of various rules of the EU treaties and so on, moving them out of the sphere of politics and into the sphere of, I know, axiology, ethics and aesthetics. This was very well visible in the comments. The comments were um, uh, after the Constitutional Tribunal's uh, judgment. The comments were like in the line of, oh, it's a shame. Oh, it's not the way to behave. You, you cannot do such things. How could you? These are not political issues. And Wojciech Sadurski, this is my final sentence, Wojciech Sadurski once said that the democratic backsliding in the EU was, and I quote, the end of the illusion of good behavior of these new member states. And the German ruling, of course, which was cited yesterday by the Polish Tribunal, was also the end of the illusion of good behavior of the old member states. Because, well, only the lawyers realized that there is the conflict that Kolya mentioned. Well, everybody else thought, okay, these are the good guys. Let's take them as our role models. And everything else is just bad behavior. There isn't any bad and good behavior, but there should be politics, I think. Thank you. Uh, I will not even try to um, summarize and make a conclusions of the, of, the, of, the, of the panel. I think there was so much for, for, of thought, for, thought um, uh, for all of us, which means we should move to a different food. Uh, right now we're having a lunch break and afterward we'll have a session about cheating and winning, meaning the book lunch event of Andras Shayo. Thank you for being with us here in Budapest and uh, online and please you know, follow us um, on social media and um, be with us because you, there will be you know, plenty of interesting things happening um, today as well. Thank you.